And then, unfortunately, we often see this disease progress. So how are you planning your subsequent treatment if the disease has progressed in first line? Can you also touch into PARP inhibitors here? Thank you. So in the context of disease progression, we'll we'll take that first and then go back to PARP inhibitors. Uh, your uh, NICE logarithm here uh, speaks to how we think about it in practice. And uh, in the world of finite choices, it's uh, sort of the opposite to what you didn't have in, in the front line. Uh, so for individuals who've had gemcitabine-based therapy, it's typically 5-FU-based uh, treatments. And usually in that setting, we have an FDA approval for liposomal arinotecan 5-FU. And that's a good choice. Or uh, Falfox. In, in, in some uh, people. For individuals who've received uh, modified fulfirinox or nalirifox, typically gemcitabine-based, I usually will try a, com a combination and certainly favor gemcitabine and napaclitaxel, but uh, other combinations may be reasonable in individuals where neuropathy is a concern or um, you know, comorbidities or preferences in terms of alopecia, et cetera. And uh, so there's, you know, a limited but some variation on the theme uh, there in the, in the second line setting. So going to PARP inhibitors, PARP inhibitors really don't work very well in the setting of progressive disease and certainly in the context of platinum progression. So right now they're FDA approved as a maintenance option after platinum-based therapy for a person with you know, germline uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, but we also include uh, people with oncogenic somatic variants and people with germline or somatic uh, PALB2 and maybe a few other rarer uh, variants in terms of the RAD51 genes. They can confer homologous repair deficiency signature. So the the best time I think, to use a PARP inhibitor is when disease is debulked, stabilized, responding, and kind of in a minimal residual disease state in advance of progression. Progression is a very poor surrogate for a favorable outcome with a PARP inhibitor. Uh, but PARP inhibitors are a very nice option as an alternative to ongoing cytotoxic therapy uh, for that particular uh, population and, you know, offer, again, some quality of life uh, benefits. They don't work for everybody, but when they do, uh, we can sometimes get some extended period of time away from uh, chemotherapy, which is uh, very meaningful. And This is certainly a tough disease to manage. Well, we have covered quite a bit here. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Reilly, for this overview of the current landscape for pancreatic cancer. For our listeners, let us recap with the key points from this talk today. In today's discussion with Dr. Eileen O'Reilly from Memorial Sloan Kettering, we covered the current standard of care treatment for pancreatic cancer. We emphasized the importance of a thorough initial workup, including genetic testing, which can significantly impact the treatment decisions. We discussed the management strategies for resectable, borderline resectable, and metastatic disease, highlighting the role of neoadjuvant therapy, surgical approaches, and importantly, systemic treatment options in this space. In this discussion, we also had a chance to touch on the emerging role of targeted therapies and the potential of NGS to look for these actionable mutations in pancreatic cancer. The multidisciplinary approach involving case collaboration with surgical and radiation oncology colleagues still remains crucial, especially in optimizing outcomes for our patients with early disease. Thank you so much for joining us. And don't forget to check out our other episodes covering conference highlights, recent approvals, and treatment algorithms. We're the Oncology Brothers.